But here is the area that we are most concerned about. This time, trying to be a, a little preventative, try to get take care of stuff before uh, it gets too bad. Days before Sandy is expected to reach the East Coast, Dane Fagan and his family drive their camper to higher ground. Just in case. But just next door, there's still lots left to do because of Irene. Yeah, I'm very concerned because I, I couldn't go through this again. 71-year-old Guy Rudd lives in a FEMA trailer on his property across from the Schoharie Creek. It's not home. I mean, it's livable. It's nice, it's you know, clean, but it's not, you know, it's not my house. Volunteers are still rebuilding the walls inside what he does call home. Saturday, National Make a Difference Day made its way into Schoharie County. So we have about 120 volunteers that came in today for Make a Difference Day. There you go. Um, everything from different college groups to some construction companies that volunteered their services and uh, the labor unions DC9, the uh, local 236 electricians union. Went up to here and out to there and then back. Oh. And all that got destroyed in the floods. So that all got taken down. The comptroller's office is actually here as well. How you doing, guys? But the Schoharie recovery director says he's directed some of those resources to preparedness things, passing out information, um, you know, making sure houses are buttoned up and winterized. And the Fagans say they plan to spend most of their weekend lending a helping hand too. We're gonna go around later today and see if anyone else needs their campers moved or trailers or whatever else. Gonna wrap that up in a nice little package. A view from above. Clear to open. As the state police harvests illegal marijuana in Washington County. See how they're waving them off? They're not ready. They're not ready because uh, they don't have enough marijuana in there yet. August is prime time for growers to harvest the plant. So pilots across the state will take to the air. They say these aerial operations are instrumental in taking marijuana off the streets. They've been doing these ops for several decades. So they're connecting the cargo net now to the long line. Thursday's eradication is their largest at close to 6,500 plants. Typically our flights will generate uh, uh, an eradication effort of, of a couple dozen, perhaps just over 100 plants. Pilot Sergeant Kathy Humphrey says they're easy to spot. The color is a very distinct, brilliant emerald green and it really pops out against the natural vegetation. But not easy to get rid of. They're cutting the marijuana by hand, very grueling work. So it's not an easy process. Okay. That's coming undone over here. Hang on, we'll get up here in a second. The marijuana will be taken to an evidence facility and destroyed. No one was arrested in connection with this harvest. I, yeah. We certainly arrest people whenever that opportunity arises. But really, the elimination of the marijuana off the street is the ultimate goal. And there they go. Prayers of despair for these members of the Lighthouse Assembly of God Church in Schenectady. The Hispanic Church on Albany Street caught fire around 1 a.m. Friday morning. When I went down, um, outside, I saw the flame. It was so high up, high up the tree, and um, you know it was like it was overwhelmed. Demolition crews were called in after building inspectors determined the church was a total loss. The pastor told us through a translator he was forced to make the decision to destroy the lighthouse. It's a shame, it's, it's sad, and there's nothing that we can do. The nature of the structure, the age, um, the use of it being a parish, uh, most of the space being just wide open, all of this just contributed to the fire just doing extensive damage very quickly. The church was not insured and was on the city's foreclosure list for failing to pay its utility bills, only making a difficult situation that much more challenging. We are one, one family in the Lord, so it makes me feel good that we are here to praise God whatsoever. It doesn't matter what we're going through. We, would, we just worship the Lord together as a family. But for the 30 or so members who lost their place of worship, they still rejoice about the future, one filled with the promise of a new tomorrow. Because as they say, when one door closes, another one opens. Well, you can be guaranteed that we are going to rebuild uh, exactly how we're going to do that. We don't know at this time, but we are going to rebuild.
it's the easiest and simplest thing that you can do to prevent yourself from being seriously injured or killed in a crash. Why wouldn't you do it? But Sergeant Dan Larkin of the New York State Police says more than 27 years after seat belts became mandatory, some people still don't comply. It's uncomfortable. Um, I don't feel well. I was only going down to the store. I just forgot, but there's no, really is no excuse. Click it or take it. Larkin says the national campaign has been successful. Here in New York State, he says 91% of people buckled up in 2011, but... At nighttime, the use rates are considerably lower. To drive home how dangerous not wearing a seat belt is, the state police uses a number of tools. This is our rollover simulator. We have uh, two adult-sized dummies and a child in a child safety seat. This time, the passengers are safely strapped in. They survived relatively unscathed just because they put this the seat belt on, the simple act of buckling up. But when the seat belts come off, your chances of surviving an ejection and a rollover crash is very low. And if you're still not convinced, check out the state police's seat belt convincer. It's a device that mimics a seven mile per hour crash. <laughs> that hurts. You really get a good sense at how much of an impact there is, even at that low speed. So then you can only imagine how much of an impact it's going to be at a much higher speed, a typical 30 or 40 mile per hour crash. Larkin says he hopes these simulations make a difference. If we could get even another 5%, uh, closer to 100% of the people buckled up all the time, day and night, we could save another couple of hundred lives each year in New York State alone. Right across your chest, click. For YNN, I'm Megan Cruz. Thank you so much for your support. Michael Garrett has been getting dozens of emails from students and parents in the close-knit Voorheesville School District. They're expressing support, shock, and outrage regarding the criminal charge against the popular fifth grade teacher. They're 100% behind me and know that they know who I am as a person, know that this was just some accident that happened in the classroom and, and they are supportive and will do anything they can do to help. Garrett is fighting to not only keep his job of 18 years with the school district, but fight a charge of endangering the welfare of a child. Back in December, he was booked by the Albany County Sheriff's Department for allegedly biting a 10 year old girl in his classroom. The bizarre story grabbed huge headlines and his reputation seemingly grumbled. Oh, I was horrified, just absolutely mortified because I knew that's not what happened. I knew that I did not bite a child, that's not who I am, um, and just very sad and, and dismayed. But what really happened in the classroom that day? Well, Garrett says the students were winding down before lunch when he made an arm wrestling bet with one of the students. The prize, no homework. He says the two sat across a desk arm in arm, and that's when the other students piled on. He says he playfully tried to win, and that's when the little girl's arm came from behind and hit his teeth. I know what happened in that classroom. The kids know what happened in that classroom. I wasn't violating their safety. That's not who I am. Garrett immediately told the principal. By law, the school is required to report this to the sheriff's department. Deputies investigated, saying they saw the mark and bruise on the girl's arm. Garrett was arrested. It's ridiculous that this man's reputation is being shattered. It's ridiculous that people can't look at this and realize this was an accident. It's time to move on, and it's time to let this man get back to his job. Since this broke, people throughout the district have been rallying behind the now suspended teacher and JV soccer coach, claiming his story has been blown out of proportion. Stella Sueb is a parent who is part of a growing campaign to save Garrett's job. He is a natural teacher, and to see him being dragged through the mud and that this might be his legacy is just ridiculous to me. And I don't think I'm alone. Garrett is set to appear in Voorheesville Village Court next Tuesday, where he'll plead not guilty. The outcome of the criminal proceedings will have an impact on his future in the district. He says he's grateful for the support and is just praying it helps. In Voorheesville, Julie Chapman, YNN.